morning this morning to the second of the Lexus Nexus breakfast forums held jointly with the Private Client Dining Club. Uh, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers this morning who are going to provide us with some insights into different aspects of high net worth immigration. Uh, and then we hope to have time this time um, for some of your questions at the end. So we have a lot to get through, so I'll hand you over to our first speaker, who is um, Nick Rolson, head of the immigration team at Kingsley Napley, which is uh, one of the largest immigration teams in the UK and consistently ranked in the top tier in the Legal 500 and Chambers and Partners directories. And Nick is going to tell us about the recent changes to the Tier 1 investor visa route. So, over to you, Nick. <laughs> Thank you, Georgie. Good morning, everybody. I have to stand over here because there's a little, there's a little uh, arrow over here. I have to keep pressing. Um, I, I, just as an introduction, I'm going, I've got about 10, 10 minutes or so, um, maybe 15 at a push. Uh, you've probably all heard all the changes that happened in April, and you've been to probably loads of presentations, so I'm not going to focus too much on the detail. We're just going to talk about the bigger picture. Um, we will look at those changes, but really what I wanted to identify is some trends that are happening at the moment, what we're seeing, um, and then hand over to James and Toby to sort of finesse some of the things that are in there about investments uh, and, and the other, other issues I'll be touching on. Um, just a very quick bit of history, you've probably heard this a hundred times, um, but I'll show you why I'm telling you this. Um, the investor visa has been around since 94 in various guises. Um, various changes happened, loan options introduced in 2005, uh, then it went into the points-based system, and um, we've had quite a major increase in the number of investor visas from 2008 onwards. Um, and then in 2011 we had the major change where uh, we had the accelerated route to settlement, to, to indefinite leave to remain for investors investing more, uh, and some other changes around uh, day counting and absences uh, for investors who wanted to qualify for, for indefinite leave to remain. Um, how that works out from 2008 in terms of numbers, um, you can see here. So in 2008, we have 68 applicants. These are entry clearance applications from outside the UK. And, and that gradually goes, and then you see in 2011, suddenly, 2011-12, because the changes happened in April 2011, that starts to jump up quite dramatically. Um, and in last year, we have almost 1,300 applications for entry clearance, so that's new investors coming in. On top of that, there's another 600 or so applications in the UK, both people applying for the first time and extending. So we're up to about 1,800 uh, applications. Um, from a, a starting point back in 2008 of 68. So all looking good for us, great, more and more clients coming in, uh, lots of these clients from China, from Russia mainly, uh, but from all over the world, and they're all clients of people in the room. Uh, we're all looking quite happy. Um, then we have uh, the recent changes, followed, which are really prompted by the government's request to the MAC to review the investor route. Um, which led to the 6th of November changes. Um, now, the biggest change obviously there is the increase from one to two million. Um, the removal of the loan option, which is where you had uh, somebody with two million pounds of net assets who could then get a UK bank to loan the million pounds to them. Um, and also new topping up rules, which were brought in in a, in a format which James will talk about after me, um, which were not really satisfactory. Um, and then finally, an issue about source of funds. So where are these funds really coming from? Who do they belong to? Do they really belong to the applicant? Um, we were all fairly blasé about it, and we all um, decided that actually most of our clients would not have a problem with the, the big headline figure of one to two million, and that they would still keep coming. There would obviously be some sort of knockoff at the bottom end of the market where uh, possibly you know, <coughs> two million might be a little bit too much. Um, and also the, the removal of the loan option uh, had quite a significant impact on the Chinese market where there are issues about moving funds out of China and the loan option was something which the Bank of China were doing quite a lot and allowing Chinese to, to show they had two million in China and loaning out of the UK, uh, out of the UK bank. So, you know, we weren't too worried about it, but there are other factors at play. Um, and those factors are the election. Uh, there was a lot of uncertainty 
this year before the election because of uh, indications there might be a, a review of the, the resident non-DOM rules um, and all sorts of other geopolitical issues, what's going on in Russia at the moment. I think Russians generally are sitting fairly tight at the moment to see what happens. So we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown, but we, we've seen a slowdown. And I, we, the figures for the first quarter of this year came out a few days ago. And you'll see all the figures there going very nicely. Uh, a big surge before the rules changed in November last year. Um, and then suddenly, the first quarter of this year, only 58 applications. Um, so there's a massive drop-off in applications. Uh, it's a quarter of what it was this time last year, approximately. Um, so that's the big headline figure for us in the room. Um, we might scratch our heads and slightly start worrying and panicking about the amount of time we've invested in developing investor visa propositions, um, marketing this as a, as a route in, um, and dedicating a lot of resources to it when the, the actual figures are dropping off. Um, we're, we're seeing drop-offs. We still have regular, regular clients coming through, um, and we have clients who've been planning to come for some time who are now coming in this year. Um, but it, there is definitely a drop-off in the numbers, um, particularly from China um, and from Russia, um, for those reasons which I mentioned before. So I think that's the headline figure in terms of the trends. Um, just to look at in a bit more detail at the, the April changes, which came in um, and followed closely on the heels of the November changes, um, I'll go through those, the, the five main changes. Um, those are principally the first two are not very, not, uh, not very interesting. Uh, the ones we're going to talk about are change three and four, which are the requirement to open up a UK-regulated investment account um, before you apply for your visa, um, and clarification to the topping up provisions, so the rules which came out in November which were completely unsatisfactory and which were reviewed with a lot of you in the room contributing to the discussions with the Home Office about what would be acceptable. Um, and then finally, the last change uh, is the power to uh, interview, um, ask people to produce evidence about whether they're meeting the requirements of the rules um, at any time. And also the introduction of credibility interviews when people go and apply for their visas. So just looking very quickly at the first two changes, um, we all know what the investments need to be made in. Um, this issue here, which is uh, B here, has caused an issue with lots of um, advisors and clients um, who say, well, how on earth do we know whether, a, bank, uh, whether a, a UK company has a bank account here? It probably will do, but where do you, find, where do you get proof of that? Um, the Home Office are, are looking at that and say it is a bit of a ridiculous requirement. Most of the time you can look in the accounts of the company and see who the bankers are um, or in the annual reports, um, but it's not always very clear. So those, those requirements haven't changed. Those have been there for a very long time. The only thing that has changed or has been clarified is the investment in property investment, property management, or property development companies. So if you're buying shares or investing into a private limited company, that's excluded. Um, but what they've done is just clarify what that means. Uh, we, are, we get approached uh, probably once a week by somebody with a wonderful new product saying, um, we've got some great company which is doing something with you know, the end, the, end, the end project is effectively a property development project, um, but we want to create a product for the investor visa. And, you know, we are telling people to steer well clear of anything that has the word property on it. Um, construction seems to be okay, um, but, you know, there are, there are real grey areas around this, which I, I feel that a lot of people who are creating these products are just trying to get around the rules. Um, to in effect actually do property investment or property development. Um, so um, we are, th that's a big trend in the market. Because, because of the issues about um, equity prices at the moment and bond yields, um, there's a lot of people who want to go into higher uh, return investments, and that's not going to be through your classic portfolio of, of gilts and equities. So we're getting a lot more queries saying, can you tell me whether this works. And there's a lot more people who are out there offering or developing these products. Um, I just try and stay quite clear of them, to be honest. Um, 
if, where I can, and unless I can see clearly that it has nothing to do with property, <laughs> which most of them do. Um, so that's just clarified that. The reason that change was brought in uh, was because, the, the, as you may know, the entrepreneur route, which is the £200,000 investment into a new or existing business, um, has a, a similar definite has a different had a different definition about what property investment was. So they wanted to make sure that it was consistent across both routes, and that it excluded um, um, effectively people investing into buying assets or developing assets, which they then sold for a profit. Um, so that's the clarification there. You remember the Home Office dropped the age to apply from 18 to 16. We all said why. No bank is going to give anybody uh, control of their accounts. In fact, you can't enter into contract until 18 in, the, in, in England and Wales. Um, there were lots of discussions about people in Scotland can have bank accounts when they're 16 and enter into contracts, so let's have it in Scotland. A lot of messing around. Um, actually, they said, well, this is pointless, and somebody pointed out to them that legally you can't control a portfolio when you're 16. So um, they went back and said, OK, fine, we'll go back to 18. And, and that's, um, that's simple. The next requirement, which has caused a lot of consternation and difficulty, is to do with opening an investment account before you apply for your entry clearance visa. The clients now have to provide, if they want to apply, they have to provide a letter from a regulated bank uh, confirming that they've opened up an account and the bank is regulated by the FCA for the purpose of accepting deposits. Now, obviously, this raised alarms um, amongst many of you here who are wealth managers who don't accept deposits, uh, and lots of other uh, wealth managers who have different structures where they've got custodian banks, um, uh, and you know, they're not holding cash. Um, so we did some jumping up and down before the, before the guidance was published, um, and I think a lot of people in the room also did that. Uh, on behalf of wealth managers who don't, who are not banks, um, and the guidance was refined to say that uh, a regulated bank is defined as a UK-based FCA-regulated financial institution, which includes wealth managers. And then uh, it then clarified that if you have opened an account with an investment manager that has a custodian bank, then the wealth manager can provide the letter. But what they were very keen to see, and the principle underlying this, is that. At the, either the UK wealth manager or the bank have undertaken due diligence, and which can be relied on um, you know, to show who the client is and the source of the funds is from proper sources. So that's the, the, the underlying principle is that due diligence is undertaken by one, one or other FCA regulated institution. Conversely, if you open up a, a, an account with a bank that uh, accepts deposits but doesn't do the wealth management piece, um, you could still get a letter from the bank that it does the deposit. So typically your custodian bank can provide a letter confirming they've opened an account if, say, the wealth manager doesn't want to provide that letter. So you can do it both ways. Um, there's, there's quite a few issues for wealth managers around this because wealth managers have all sorts of structures and platforms on you know, how, how they do their wealth management in the UK. You might have a Swiss bank that doesn't have a bank in the UK but has a wealth management platform and that has custodian which might be a bank or which might not be a bank and I was quite surprised to discover that custodians can actually don't have to be banks um, they can actually be LLPs or other structures um, which was news to me but um, the main thing that we've un that we understand from the Home Office is that as long as the principle that due diligence is being undertaken is adhered to because remember these these exa these are examples given here by the Home Office they're not the rules, they're just guidance and they're an example, as long as the principle that the bank or the custodian or whatever or the wealth manager is doing the due diligence is adhered to, then we won't have an issue. Um, but there are still some grey areas and I think some of the wealth managers are getting a bit worried that people are, um, you know, they don't absolutely meet the requirements of the rules and therefore they're issuing all sorts of disclaimers to say that, you know, will give you a letter, but it might not meet the requirements of the rules. So the, the reason this was done is obviously for due diligence purposes. The Home Office uh, kept seeing people getting visas, coming in, either not being able to open accounts or then discovering that they are wanted for extradition or all sorts of other things because of money laundering and other reasons. And they're just wondering how on earth do these people get 
into the UK and managed to open up a portfolio. Um, so the big change there is most applicants will need to come to the UK. Uh, we think banks want to see clients so, and customers, so they'll probably have to come here. Um, this is, in a way, quite good news um, in some regards, because particularly in the Chinese market, um, we saw a lot of investors being sold the investor visa as a product, not being advised about anything to do with tax, um, opening up accounts in the UK and due diligence, ending up here without a clue on what they're supposed to be doing and then getting stuck and, and in difficulty. So in a way, this is a good opportunity to get those, those clients in, to advise them, to make sure they're fully advised, <coughs> rather than them just getting some agent spouting a load of rubbish to them about what the investor visa is and then coming in with, with a visa that doesn't work for them. Um, it'll also it'll deal with the 90-day opening issues, which was a big problem for those clients without um, accounts. Uh, and again, there's that thing about the structure, which I mentioned. Um, topping up provisions, I'm probably going to leave that to James to talk about, but um, there's been a lot of discussion around what the topping up provisions mean. But in, in essence, um, the requirement to top up has gone, and it's replaced by a, uh, a requirement to reinvest the gross proceeds of all sales, uh, include, including those made at a gain, into the calling and fine investments in the portfolio. I think that's probably the simplest way of saying it. Um, James will talk about the, the, the ins and outs of doing that. Um, but the, the purpose behind it was to try and move people away from bonds. I don't think that works at all, really. Um, you know, it, in, in a way, it kind of encourages people not to do anything. Um, so it's not really what the government wanted to do. Um, and there's no transitional provision. So these, the, the old rules on topping up came up in November, which were then, we then complained about. They were changed in, um, in April. And the rule changes basically as if they never existed. So it's, it's a little bit weird that there's no transitionals. Um, but we think that most people who came in in that short window won't have been affected by the old November rules uh, before the change happened. Um, so James will talk about the ins and outs of how you, what money you can take in and out of the portfolios and how you can manage that and how you can manage interest and dividends. Um, new home, home office powers, we don't think it's going to be a big issue, but the home office have new powers um, giving caseworkers the power to require people <coughs> to provide evidence that they are still meeting the requirements of the rules. This is principally aimed at entrepreneurs. Um, the Home Office hate entrepreneurs with a passion. They all think they're abusive and dodgy. Uh, and even where they've set up a hedge fund worth millions, they end up you know, um, being put in the same pool as, as people who've um, you know, bought a subway franchise, which I can tell you the Home Office don't like. Um, and what it, what it enables people to do is to say, we want to check your business, see you've made the investment, see the investments are still held there, see you're really genuinely employing people. But the knock-on effect is that they can do that with any visa category, including the investor visa. So they could come and say, we want to see you're maintaining the investment, we want proof, we want to see you've, done the, you've made the investment within the required 90 days. Um, and there are powers to curtail visas for people who don't do that. The other thing, that has come up fairly recently are credibility interviews. Um, when you now go and apply for your visa online, um, just before you're about to submit the application, this little box pops up and it says, please be aware that all applicants in all categories, including investors, um, will, will, be, will be required to attend a credibility interview at the visa application center. So what happens is now is you make your appointment, you go into the biometric center, you give your fingerprints and your photograph, you hand in your documents, and visa application staff can interview you about what you're coming to do um, and ask you, you know, why are you coming to the UK, what's the purpose of you getting an investor visa, blah, blah. I don't, we, don't, we haven't seen the questions they're asking investors, we've seen them for other categories yet, um, but they are able to do that. And if they don't think you're credible, if they think, well, this is all a load of rubbish, um, and this person really isn't coming here and they don't know what they're doing, um, they can pass that on to the visa officers who are making the decision, who look at this little note from them, whatever it will say, you know, a little note at the bottom saying dodgy or refuse or, you know, 
person didn't know what job they were going to be doing. Um, so we, we, we're likely to see a bit more sort of front-end questioning of clients uh, at the visa stage, which they haven't had so far. Um, so we'll see how that, how that works out. Um, just a few other points as well. Immigration health surcharge, as, you, as we know, all of our um, investor clients are going to be using the NHS and hospitals massively and you know, overburdening the NHS. So they have to pay £200 per person per year for each of the years that they come to the UK. Um, and that's been in effect since 6th of April. Uh, it's not really, a, not really an issue for our clients. Um, and the other thing is as well is that the Home Office are reviewing all sorts of things. So the government has asked the Home Office to review the, the entrepreneur route. They're also just about to ask the Home Office to, uh, to ask the Migration Advisory Committee to review the Tier 2, the skilled worker route, um, uh, fairly shortly, we think, over the summer. Uh, so there's a lot of reviews going on. And we're also likely to see a further review of the investor visa at some stage, we think, towards the end of this year, um, to look at the investment types and whether <coughs> some of the issues which were raised in the Migration Advisory Committee report about investment types and whether people should be able to put money into charitable donations um, might, might become a reality. So watch this space. Um, there may be some further developments and more opportunities for you as, as investment advisors and, adv and lawyers and other intermediaries to advise clients on different ways of investing which might be much more attractive. Um, we're particularly interested in infrastructure, um, social enterprises, and philanthropic donations, which are three of the areas that we've been pushing for um, with the Home Office for some time, and which we put forward to the MAC as a, as a, as a suggestion. So we'll see what happens, um, but watch this space. Thank you very much. <coughs> hand over to...